Hello and welcome to the show. It's me, John Park. It's time for John Park's workshop. Thank you for joining me here in the workshop. It's uh, so fun to be with you and sharing and exploring some cool tech projects and things. Uh, I am talking with the people, the good people of our Discord over here. If you're wondering where the chat is at, that's a good place to check out. It's our Discord server, uh, and that is adafru.it slash Discord. You can head to the live broadcast chat channel right now, but we also have others, uh, others available. And uh, the, actually, the, the, the concept of daylight savings time and when it happens just cropped up. So, uh, Andy Calloway there was saying, hey, why is this show on an hour early? And that's, um, that's an excellent question. That's because we changed our, our time and wherever you are, Andy, they didn't uh, until the end of March. Okay. Uh, so yeah, here we are though at my one o'clock PM Pacific time with daylight savings thing happening. Uh, and what have we got? Oh, and Gary Z says in Arizona, it never changes. That's right. I think I knew that. Did I know that? Uh, I think I knew that. So we've got some cool, fun, interesting stuff to explore today. I'm excited to, to share some things with you. Um, before I get into that stuff, however, I would like to offer you a discount code. So if you head over to Adafruit and you look for some stuff that you want to buy, uh, this week you can, or today rather, until midnight, you can use this coupon code, SCRAMBLE. That's going to get you 10% off in the Adafruit store. Uh, head on over. This is, uh, let's see, is this my, yeah, that's the, that's the link right there. There's the store. Uh, you can go to products. You can click on view all under new. You can click on view all under featured. You can go through categories. You can shop all possible categories. Uh, you can even do what I've done on occasion, which is just type in a, a number and see what's at the end of it. So if you do adafruit.com slash products, product, I think it's singular, uh, and type in a number. Hey, there we go. 342 is the Wii controller, nunchuck, Wii chuck. Uh, so that's kind of fun. We have not all numbers. Some numbers have been retired, uh, but I think I've done this before. What's the, what's the lowest number? I think seven might still exist. No, it doesn't. Uh, I can't remember. There's, there's some pretty low number items that do still exist. Is it 11? I'm going to guess 11. Nope. Uh, but let me know. Someone, someone go poke around. Uh, anyway, that's one way to look for stuff. But however you want to look for stuff, you can get yourself a nice discount at the end of the whole thing uh, by using Scramble as your 10% off discount code. Also, we have some good freebies. So if you are interested in getting a bunch of stuff, we have a few different little breakpoints where you can get free things. Uh, they're listed actually right here. If you go to go back to the store and uh, just type in free, adafruit.com slash free, 
You'll see this, I think, also other places, including on your way out as you're checking out. Uh, but you'll see we've got right now $99 order will get you a free Permaproto half size breadboard PCB. $149 and up will get you that and a free KB2040. $200 will get you those first two freebies and free UPS ground shipping in the continental US. And for an order over $300, you'll get all of those previous things plus a Circuit Playground Express. Um, hey, wait a second. Circuit Playground Express, you say? I thought those were out of stock. Well, uh, yeah, those were hit really hard. The SMD 21s were hit, of course, by the parts shortage during the pandemic. No longer. Uh, we have lots and lots and lots of those. We had a huge order, I believe, that was placed before all of this, uh, all of this pandemic stuff happened. And those orders are coming through. So we are able to put together boards that have been out of stock for a long time. Circle Playground Express is a great one, uh, really useful for educators and people learning. Uh, but it's also just a great, great board for, uh, for development. We've got them. And you get one for free for spending $2.99 or more at the store. Just get yourself a 10% off with Scramble. Uh, and, oh, let's see, we've got more talk in Discord about daylight savings time switches. Uh, Johnny Bergdahl says in Sweden, it's the 26th of March that you switch. Uh, Australia is the same, no change at all. Some states don't, some do. It's very confusing. Uh, all right, so what else do we have going on? Uh, I have this show on Tuesdays that you may be aware of. It's called JP's Product Pick of the Week. On it, I like to pick something, uh, such as this. Hey, these came back in stock too. We've got M4s. M4 chips have been hard to come by, but they're starting to come back in line. So I was able to do a 50% off discount during the show only. So tune in on Tuesdays. It's at 4 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and you will uh, usually get a 50% off with a new product that I pick, take you through some of the paces, show you some of the things I like about it, and uh, here's a little one-minute excerpt from this week's show. Ding, 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 ding. ding. The Grand Central Metro M4 Express Cortex M4 chip. Fantastic for running Circuit Python as well as Arduino. The number of analog pins on it is one of the huge draws for me. It has 16 easily available analog pins. Here's my Grand Central, and I have a proto board on top of it, to which I've soldered 16 little potentiometers uh, and wired those up to the 16 analog inputs on the Grand Central. And now you'll see if you look at this top, these top two rows of eight knobs as I turn the potentiometers in my Grand Central, I'm changing the position of those knobs in the software and there, thereby I'm uh, adjusting parameters on this video synth. It is the Grand Central Metro M4 Express. Yes, sorry about that there. I had an echo. Um, I had left my mic on, was, uh, was moving around. You probably heard noises and things as I was setting some stuff up. Uh, apologies for that, but you can find the non-echo version if you like that, the uh, non-echo version of that video up on YouTube, and I believe it's out on our socials as well. Um, sorry about that. Put it back. Everyone thinks it sounds epic. Now I want to hear, I'll, I'll go back and listen to this live stream and hear what that sounds like. Uh, oh, it sounded like Grand Central Station, even better. Uh, all right, so let's, uh, next up, let me show you a really neat little uh, tip I've got for you today in CircuitPython, uh, and that's going to be in our CircuitPython Parsec. Yes, echo, echo, echo. All right, I think I left the echo on that time deliberately. That's what I'm, that's my story. Uh, all right. For the CircuitPython Parsec today, I wanted to show you how to use one-liners in CircuitPython. So what is a one-liner? Well, a one-liner is a series of commands that you've strung together using semicolons to separate them, which acts just like a line break in normal uh, code.py Python code, CircuitPython code. Uh, we can string together a few little commands in order to test something, debug something, achieve an effect. Uh, here you can see I've got a little text file, essentially, of some of these one-liners. Uh, and what happens is if I take my board here, I've got this little uh, cutie pie. 
which one is this? This is a Cutie Pie uh, ESP32 S2, uh, but it doesn't matter. It'll work on, on any circuit Python board. Uh, what you'll do is plug it in, go to your REPL, and then hit Control C to uh, break the code. It'll stop the code from running, stop the current cycle of code. And now you essentially get this command prompt where you can talk to your board. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to triple click right here and copy import board semicolon dir parentheses board. If I come down into my REPL and paste that, since my copying actually also copied the line break, I don't even have to press return. I paste it in there. It automatically runs it. Uh, and now we get the list of pins that are available on this board. Uh, so I have A0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is really useful for when you're wondering, hey, what are the names of the pins on a board here? Uh, or if you want to actually find out the, not the circuit Python names, but the GPIO uh, names of them, you can use that next line. Import microcontroller, dir microcontroller.pin. Uh, and another one that I really like here is for checking out NeoPixels. So I'm going to grab this one. You can see this line here. It imports board, imports NeoPixel. Then it creates a NeoPixel object named LEDs. In this case, I'm setting it on the onboard NeoPixel, named NeoPixel. Uh, and then it uh, is told that there's one NeoPixel. I want a brightness of 0.2. And then I'm going to fill it. In this case, fill it a purple color. So if I come down here into my command prompt and just hit paste, you can see it ran all of those separate commands, strings them together, and now I've changed the color of that NeoPixel. And this is really great for debugging. It's not how you'd want to normally run a light show or something like that. Uh, here's one that will deinitialize that. Uh, if you want, then we could come up here and change the uh, color. Let's go to, how about something like this. Again, I'm going to triple click and copy and paste. Oh, what I do? I, I used O's instead of zeros. Let's try that again. So there I can copy, paste, and now I've changed the color to like a cyan. So this is a way that you can use one-liners inside of CircuitPython to speed up your debugging. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. And a big thank you to Todd Kurt for uh, introducing me to this concept of one-liners. And this list is taken from... Todd's GitHub page called CircuitPython Tips and Tricks. It's also on our learn guide by the same name. Uh, so you can go check those out. There's some other nice ones there. For uh, example, if your board is reloading, I had a tip the other day about uh, importing supervisor and using that to disable auto reload. Again, we've got that right here in a little one-liner in case you need to just work on the board. You don't want it to be resetting itself and you're just typing in stuff directly into the REPL to test something out. Uh, all right. Yeah. Thank you, Todd. Thanks for sharing those. Let's see. What else have we got going on here today? Um, I have a quick gear report I wanted to do. Um, and I, I sort of showed this on my CircuitPython Parsec. It was a, it was a second demo that I did. Um, and this was just something I picked up at the thrift store that I'm kind of enjoying playing around with. Uh, I've got it suctioned to something over here, so I need to carefully move that. Uh, and that is this flight stick. So uh, actually, I left the box inside. I should have grabbed that because it came in the original Radio Shack box. Uh, this is a Radio Shack flight stick. Uh, this uses a DB15 connector, and it was designed for use in DOS games and then later Windows uh, over the joystick port. Uh, and there's a standard that's used. Not, uh, there, there are variations on them, but the, the connector is pretty standard. Uh, and this, this type of early flight stick joystick tends to follow a standard of uh, the pinout having uh, four analog lines, which are the X and Y axis for the joystick. And then it can vary what the other ones are used for. This one only uses uh, lines one, two, and four. It skips the, the third one. Uh, but line four is for this throttle here, so you get analog reads from that. Uh, and then it has four buttons, so that's, that's typically how it is. There's a ground, there's a power, uh, there's, there's four buttons, and then there's four analog axes. So you can see this one has trigger, red button, red button, red button. 
Uh, and this one also has some tricks up its sleeve. There's some settings that you can flip uh, here using some little switches that'll allow you to turn on and off uh, the use of the throttle in case your game gets confused by that. It'll just stop sending that signal. Uh, you can flip turbo on here and it'll light up a little LED and then the uh, buttons when you press them will automatically um, pow, 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 faster than you can imagine. There's actually two different speed settings for that. Uh, and then you can engage or disengage this hat stick, which is also uh, sort of like a matrix of buttons since there's only four lines. This one sends little binary codes of flipping three or four buttons in different orders on uh, and off at the same time. So uh, some of that I've got uh, running on this uh, Grand Central here and I'm using resistors to connect those up. Uh, and one interesting thing I found out about these is that they tend to use a uh, similar technique to the Atari paddles, which I've looked into before. Uh, the analog read on these is most accurate when you use the technique that the computers used, which was they uh, reset the line uh, to twiddle a capacitor that's on each of those analog lines and uh, read how long it takes to, to charge that. So there's a, a timing component to the analog read that's more complicated than what I'm doing here. Uh, here you can use a resistor to ground and also just read the potentiometer, but it's not linear. Uh, so it has some nonlinearity to the, the numbers you get back. So it's kind of interesting. If you look, there's some uh, existing Arduino libraries out there. I don't think there's a CircuitPython library for dealing with that particular type of joystick, but you can still read it as, as a... Uh, a little more crudely as an analog in. So that was kind of a fun fun find. Uh, got it at a thrift store for about $8 and said, hey, why not? Now I have a flight stick. Um, who knows what I'll do with it. Also got really good suction cups on the bottom. Uh, so that is my little gear report there. Uh, and my project I want to talk about this week is also a bit of a gear report thing. Uh, and that's because I picked up some arcade PCBs. And you can see uh, down there, the title of the show today is Konami Arcade Board. So um, I have never owned an arcade cabinet. I have not got the space for it, although since I do have a number of CRTs and now I picked up some of these arcade boards, the thought occurred to me, hey, maybe I can get these things working together without all of the bulk of an arcade cabinet and maybe not even all of the big wiring harnesses and things that are associated with it. So... Um, so that's what I'm working on, and I've, I've got uh, a spoiler alert. I think I've got one working, sort of. I had it working for a moment and, and shut it off uh, just because I was running out of time, and uh, it requires actually some, some rewiring of stuff to check out. So uh, we're going to do that live, but I think it's going to work. Um, and here's what we're talking about. So if you're not familiar, um, arcade cabinets from the earliest days of arcades used a board that contained the logic of the game, uh, and sometimes in the case of this board here, a, uh, a separate board that is the sound of the game. So uh, some of these, some of the early primitive ones like Pong were just simply logic gates. Others uh, contain ROMs and RAM uh, and Flash and other things like that, and then they can get much, much more sophisticated. Uh, this one dates back to around 1980, I think 83 or so. Um, and one thing that the industry standardized on, uh, a couple levels of standardization actually, is the notion of using an edge connector uh, to plug in a wiring harness to then get out to the things that you need. But really uh, what, this, what this needs to actually run is a source of power. It needs uh, a connection to uh, a monitor, a video monitor, usually using RGB and sync uh, lines, and uh, then an input for buttons. Uh, buttons, switches, uh, you know, most of the joysticks were also buttons and switches, so there's no analog, it's just a bunch of digital uh, I.O. Um, and then that's one layer of standardization. Some, some games won't have uh, an edge connector. But then the next level of standardization at one point was uh, the introduction of the JAMA standard, which I think stands for Japanese Association of mm, something, something, something. It's the arcade uh, amusement organization in Japan that said, hey, why don't we standardize on 
the pinout and the connectors so that you can have an arcade cabinet and just swap new boards into it and new graphics uh, and never have to do a lot of work for the rewiring. Uh, so this one is not a JAMA board, but it uh, contains pretty much the same info and there are adapters to go, th go into that standard, which is, is uh, more common to find uh, ways to hook that up easily to controllers and easily to, to monitors and easily to sound. Uh, what I'm doing today, however, is the most bare bones version of that possible, which is, uh, first of all, determining what the board is. This one says frog on it, uh, and the maker is Konami. And when you Google this up, you find out that this is a Konami game called Scramble, hence today's coupon code. Uh, and it has had the uh, game ROMs swapped out for a bootleg of Frogger. Um, this was in cabinets, so I, I imagine, I feel like when I was a kid, you did run into stuff where you're like, hey, this is pretty much Space Invaders, but it's got a different name on it, but everything else is completely ripped off other than the title and, and the graphics on the, on the cabinet. Uh, this is another case of that. So I don't know when, where, how that happened. Uh, so this one, the, the conversion at least was done in 1983 on this one. It says January of 1983. Um, I think that's what the, the writing on there was. Someone took a scramble board, swapped out some chips, uh, and I think did a bunch of bodging. If you look on there, you'll see a bunch of bodge wires. Um, so this... Um, Pinout is available for this board. So this is a Konami Classic board. There's a lot of games that ran pretty much on this board or very similar, enough so that they standardized that output. A lot of boards from Konami and Stern had this output. Uh, it was actually a two-layer um, edge connector. Uh, so on this one, I think there's 36 pins or something like that. Uh, 18 on what's called the board layer and 18 what's called the solder layer there. Uh, and you can find the pinout, which is essentially things like, okay, we have a uh, positive 5 volts. We have a couple of ground pins on this side and on the, on the back side. We have uh, a negative 5 volts and we have a 12 volts. So that's, that's what, again, fairly standard thing that these arcade boards want. Uh, plus 5, plus 12, and sometimes negative 5. Uh, and then there are four pins somewhere around here that are the uh, red, green, blue and sync, RGB and sync lines. Now, uh, you know I've, I've got some of these uh, PVM CRT monitors, professional video monitors and broadcast video monitors. Uh, these accept red, green, blue sync signal. They also will let you use other things like component, which is a uh, three lines. One, one has color and sync, the other two are color. Um, YP, PB, PR. You'll see those, uh, those three cable sort of RCA connectors on some older uh, TVs, nicer older TVs. Uh, and then some TVs you'll just need to use composite or um, S-video. So there are boards that'll convert that. But the nice thing is the um, board here, it just has RGB sync coming out of it. And I can hook that directly uh, with BNC connectors to that type of monitor. So um, let's jump over to the workbench here. And let's see if I can actually get some of this working. I'll show you what I've done so far towards the, uh, the wiring goals here. And, and I'm not done, but enough to at least try some stuff. So um, let me just bring up my Discord over here so I can see what's what. Do, do, do. Okay. Um, so what you can see right here on this board, um, I actually have uh, three of this pretty much exact board from what I can tell. Um, I got these at an estate sale, so I don't know much about them other than what I can see here. Um, and if you look on, let me move something out of the way of my monitor there. If you look on the edge connector here, you can see I've just soldered on some sort of temporary wiring uh, since I don't have an edge connector to friction fit onto there, which would be much preferable to this, and, and I'll, be, I'll be ordering some stuff so I can uh, make life easier for myself. But uh, you can see here, I've got my five volt ground, uh, another ground there, because I needed one for the video signals. Here's my uh, RGB. Let me, let me make this a little bigger for you to see. So 
So yeah, there's five volt ground. These are uh, tied together on the board, top and bottom. See that big fat ground trace running all around this thing. Uh, here's the red, green, blue sink. Uh, these are almost entirely IO. Uh, so there's player one select coin, player two select uh, three buttons, I think, per player, and then each joystick takes four buttons. Um, so that pretty much covers top and bottom most of these. Um, and then I think there's a coin counter. There's two, uh, two traces that are used for a coin counter. Um, and then uh, this here is the 12 volt line. I used orange here so I could kind of keep that straight. And then on the bottom side of it, I've got my negative five. Um, so I have all of that running to a power supply that's giving me the positive 5 and 12 and the negative 5 uh, with, with a common ground. And then uh, I can't show, I'm, I'm nervous to move stuff just because a lot of the wiring is with like screw terminals. Um, so I'm going to leave the monitor here, but just believe me that there's a, there's a set of four wires running into the back of this monitor uh, coming from those cables. Um, and... Uh, oh, Tyeth says, can you just jam it between a double rail of 2.54 millimeter header? That's a great question. Do I have some double? I don't have any double right here. I'll, I'll try that. <laughs> I like that idea. That's cool. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. So interesting thing about this board. I plugged it in. I think I set all my monitor settings to the right thing to try to use an external sync on the RGB uh, line in. Nothing. Um, and I said, darn, because since I have soldered to this one, I have kind of boxed myself in. I don't have the connector. I don't have an easy way to say, okay, what if that board was just bad, has some issue with it? Um, I can't just plug this one in. Except I sort of can because I realized uh, the top is just the soundboard, and that's where everything is connecting. And then it's sending anything it needs to to the second board, or, or they're communicating, uh, over this big ribbon cable here. So I can actually swap out this bottom board without having to do any uh, desoldering. So uh, if you'll bear with me, that's exactly what I'm going to do right now is swap out uh, the bottom board here, the logic board here. And the way this works is there's some nice uh, 50 pin, I believe it is, ribbon cable here. Set that there. Uh, and then there are four screws and standoffs between the two boards. Uh, and then there's also some mounting tabs that you can see these kind of orange uh, feet here and here. There's four of those. Let me get even further out here for a moment. And try to get that focused up. Yeah, I think um, more modern boards tend to not need a secondary board just for sound, just as things got smaller. Um, you tended to not need a separate board for sound. And then things got more complicated as like separate 3D daughter cards and things came into play. So it's, uh, I think it, things varied over the years in arcade board design. Uh, I am just leaning over here to, since I'm running out of workbench space here, um, get the second board taken apart. And I have um, no idea what's wrong with the first one, and I haven't had much time to diagnose anything. Um, you know, there's always the chance that it's something simple like a capacitor that needs to be replaced. That would be the best case scenario. Uh, okay, so I'm taking the soundboard from the first one and I'm just gonna set it over here. I'm not using that now and I'm not re-soldering my wiring or anything like that. So I won't be using that. Uh, and then we get these four little spacers. 
And the four little feet just drops off of these little mounting feet. So these are really nice. These uh, have a um, threaded insert in them to receive the screw, uh, a little rubberized bottom. So this would go into the inside of the arcade cabinet and just could get screwed with a wood screw if you needed to right into the, into the cabinet there. There's probably nicer ways, but I'm sure that happened a lot. Uh, okay, so that is, let me see if there's an identifying feature between these so I don't mix them up. Yeah, okay, the, the good one's number starts with a two, the bad one starts with a three. So remind me of that if I get confused during all of this. Um, so I'm gonna take this one. I don't see any obviously exploded capacitors. Oh, that one's a little, maybe a little bulgy and suspicious looking. Okay, so I'm going to set this over here. We'll call you the suspicious one. Uh, one thing I noticed on this is that there is this set of uh, ROMs, maybe, that end at six, and there's two uh, empty sockets here. I think this was how part of the conversion from Scramble to Frogger worked because it's consistent across uh, the, the three identical sets that I have. Either that or someone rated three sets for the exact parts they needed for something else, but um, we will hope that that's not the case. By the way, I should mention this is all powered off right now. There's no power running to, to this board. And I'm just lining up these feet best I can. And then I'll set our spacers back. Yeah, so like I said, I don't have any um, buttons or joysticks wired up. Uh, so Initially, I just want, and I don't have sound wired up, uh, but initially I just want to see if I can get video. Uh, I am new to this hobby, uh, so pardon me if I get things wrong about it. I will say one thing I've looked into a little bit is um, something called a super gun, which is a all in one board that does kind of what I'm trying to replicate here. Uh, it's a little PCB that'll have some video out ports, some joystick in ports, uh, a standardized power supply, a thing called a kick harness, which is used to add additional uh, two more players, uh, typically to the JAMA standard. Um, uh, screw terminals to plug your speakers or amps into. Uh, so there are nice ways essentially to consoleize uh, an arcade PCB. And uh, there are even some open source uh, ones, so I might look into building one of those or, or just getting something. Because um, it'll make it a lot more convenient than using a bench power supply and uh, soldering directly to here or making other wiring harnesses, uh, which as fun as it is, it's nice to just plug something in. There are even, I remember this from back in the early and mid 90s, uh, if you play Neo Geo games, the Neo Geo arcade games, a lot of their fighting games had, a, had not only a JAMA standardized board, but the board itself had a cartridge. So some parts of it were just consistent from game to game. Uh, but then there were, the arcade owners could order from uh, their supplier from Neo Geo these big, humongous looking cartridges that would go into the board inside of the arcade cabinet. So it's kind of a fun, um, all, all video game methods of plugging stuff in happening in, under one roof. Uh, okay, so those are physically connected. Uh, and now I'm going to connect their ribbon connectors here.
and these are keyed to only go in one way, and they even have the little locking tabs. Okay, so uh, I guess the one thing I want to do is just check continuity to make sure I'm not shorting power um, before I light this thing up. Okay, so uh, this is the five, I can zoom in again actually. Like so, pardon the wiggle. Uh, so this is the five volt and the ground, and it just discharged a, a little cap or something, but there's no, no continuity there, that's good. Uh, same with 12 volt and negative five. Yeah, so I'm just kind of charging a little cap when I do that, but it's not a consistent short or anything. Uh, so that's good. I feel better about that. Let's uh, go ahead and plug ground back. I think I left that on. Yeah, you can see from the tally light there. Uh, let me switch cameras. And now I'm gonna fire up. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yes. Look, it's Frogger. It's sideways. Um, so this game is in what's called Tate mode. So it was, your screen was vertical in the cabinet. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to tip this over just because I'll probably have to recalibrate it um, if I do that. So we'll, we'll just look at it sideways for now. But let me, uh, let me zoom that camera in a little. And... Uh, All right, I don't know if anyone wants to play Frogger on a nine inch screen, but that's what we got. Uh, there's no flicker in real life. That's just um, happening from uh, refresh rate stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Do you see, I don't know what, I saw a bunch of garbage on screen there and then it sort of straightens itself out, it looks like. Um, okay, so now this is the diagram I made for myself of, um, the edge connectors with the B top side here and the A top, uh, bottom side down there. So underneath are all of my, um, almost all of my buttons for uh, player one. So I colored those wires white. Um, I forgot to, I didn't put on here, I'll have to check what, which ones are which because I want to try to find the coin uh, button to insert a coin. Oh, and look, yeah, this says frog. Yeah, so, so these bootlegs say frog instead of frogger. You almost can't notice because they filled in the last two things with some frogs there. Uh, so, but what I, what I should be able to do is take a alligator clip um, and connect it to ground, which happens to be the same on bottom and top. So normally you can't use this because you're going to short things if you, if you use an alligator clip uh, on this edge connector, but I can connect to ground. So, so now I've got, let me zoom that camera even more. Oh, it's always very tenuous. Shouldn't be moving things. Okay, so now I should be able to touch buttons by tapping the other end of this to, uh, to things. What I want to do is actually look real quick at my uh, pinout. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. <laughs> it's so exciting. It's exciting to actually get this thing sort of working. Uh, let me go to let me bring up this window right here, if I can find you. That's you, yeah, okay. Uh, and I'm gonna do a Konami scramble P. 
pin out. Okay, so this is it right here. I can zoom this up. Uh, so you can see this was done in the days of ASCII art. There's also some manuals that people have uploaded, which is great, uh, with schematics and everything. Um, but you can see why I made my, uh, this version here. Grab a pencil. Uh, so that it looks like what it looks like to me and it's kind of oriented the way I'm looking at it. So what I'm going to do is just write down a couple of these. Um, so on the solder side, starting on the left, we've got two player, two player. Okay, one, but one person start. Uh, button one, button two. Right up coin. Right up coin. So I'm going to need to put a coin in uh, and then down. And then up on the top of the board is, let's see, one player left down. Where's one player start? One player start. I wrote that one down. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'll need the coin. Followed by start. Let's see if we can make that work. What was the high score on it? Did it say? 4630. It's still got the high score stored. That's not high, is it? I don't, I don't remember what Frogger scores, what good Frogger scores look like. Uh, I probably won't beat it with uh, just the one uh, alligator clip instead of a joystick. Uh, Super U asks, what, uh, what's the negative five volts for? Uh, if anyone knows, let me know. I, I, what, I, what I read was that these Konami boards, some games use the negative five volts, some don't. And I don't know what the, the ones that use it, use it for. So some people have had to put a jumper to disable or enable the five volt line uh, when they're using some Konami boards. Uh, good question though, if someone wants to look that up or hazard a guess, I'd love to, love to hear about it. Okay, so let's try, let's go back to the main cam here and a bench cam here and let's see if I can enter a coin. We're not gonna hear any sound. I don't have speakers hooked up. I haven't really looked into like what impedance speakers we want on there, so I'm a little scared to just try plugging stuff in. Okay, so uh, coin is going to be three over from here. Does that do something? Nope. Did I get it wrong? Let's see. So from the green line this should be something down and coin. Something down, coin. There we go, I got one. So I've got two credits on there now. Sorry, that's really small, but uh, believe me, that says, okay. Uh, so start is gonna be, and I should probably find out, oh yeah, we, we, don't have to, we don't have to do anything right away. We can just sit and watch traffic, right? So this will be the, from, There to one, two, this will be start. So from one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Anything? Have I convinced it? No, my credits are back to zero. That's no good. Let's try that again. What did I say over? Three over from... No? All right. Let's try some random button pressing. I got a credit, didn't I? Credit one. So what that was, was one of these up on the top. Okay, I wonder if my pinout's wrong. Six, I have six credits now. 
Okay, let's try start. So that's one, two, three, four, five in. One, two, three, four, five. No, nope. all right, let's try, try top side. Maybe I just got totally, totally wrong. One, two, three, four, five. These are all allegedly IO, so I'm pretty safe just touching them. What's that say? Push start button. Oh. I lost my ground there. We're back to zero. Yeah, you know what? I must be hitting something that's like a reset. All right, let's double check our pin out and see if there's an alternate. Uh, I guess there's a. Yeah, that, that would be strange if it were different from, if the, it could be the Frogger layout is different. Uh, reset, yes, now you can play. Select player first, one or two. Oh, select player one. Okay, I've got to do this, so let's try that before I, before I change that. Okay, so which, uh, I'm just going to come over here real quick. Let me write down what the player selects are. Thank you, Super U. Uh, where's my... So what on here is... Player select. Two player button, left start, one right up. Hmm. Did anyone guess what player select is? Service switches on the start on the top side. Huh. I wonder if coin counter two and one are players two and one select. Hmm. Oh, one piece start. Okay, yeah, one piece start. Yeah, that's what I was trying. That should be the player select, right? One or two, one piece start. All right, so one piece start. Yeah, so, so let me try this other theory, which is what if um, Frogger actually has a different layout for those pins. That totally could happen. Uh, so here we'll click on Konami Classic and look for Frog. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> yeah. This is Frog. Where is the layout? I'm trying to remember. It's a color hack of Frogger. Let me just look and see. Yeah, okay, they're saying the conversion class. This is the same layout. Yeah, this is pretty standard, right? That's what I wrote down, so yeah. Negative five volt speaker. Two player, two player, player one start. You got me. I just, I'll, I'll go and just give it another try uh, and see. Try it out and find out method. Let's do that. I'm heartened at least by the fact, well, first of all, that we got video. That's really exciting. Uh, second, that the uh, coin counter does seem to, to increase. So credits are back to zero. Does that time out, I wonder? So we thought coin was two, three over from one, two, three. Three, okay. Uh, I mean, I guess the other possibility, I didn't even look. I'm assuming that grounding these is how these are supposed to work. Is there a chance that, that that's not really how I'm supposed to be uh, actuating these switches? That could be, right? That's just kind of my naive assumption that grounding grounding and, uh, and these pin inputs is how this work. Uh, okay, so 
player one select was the th one, two, three, four, fifth in. One, two, three, four, five in from the bottom. That did something? No, that's just the, the loop. Coins. Player one. Oh. Nope. Coins. It doesn't like that. All right. Oh, I don't know what that one was. All right, I think I'm out of ideas on just noodling with it. I'll, I'll get back to you uh, next week once I've actually researched this a bit. Yeah, maybe pull it up via a resistor. That's a good question. Yeah, are we in a demo mode? There's so many possibilities. Yeah, I, I know so little about this that I won't... Uh, I won't torture you with me just guessing around for, for the moment. But thank you for playing along. Uh, it's really exciting to look. We've actually got a loop of frog running on that board. Um, so you know what I'll be playing with. And uh, Lady Aiden and I were talking about maybe some potential projects using uh, this, which is fun. If you want to look around, like I said, I'm new to this. Uh, but if you want to look around, there are some... Uh, some boards out there, even on eBay, that aren't ridiculously expensive, uh, if they're not super popular ones. Um, I think maybe these go for like $85 or something like that for these. Uh, oh, Tyeth says, what happens when you do the service switch, like operator mode? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm curious enough to try that. Let's, uh, let's give that a quick shot before we go. So where service switch is, is on the parts side. Seven... Position seven, I'm just gonna write that on my cheat sheet here. Super U, make a feather out of it. Yeah, we could, we could condense this <laughs> considerably. Uh, I mean, I could just play this on the Pico thing that I built, the little Pico uh, NES ROM, play, play a Nintendo's port. Uh, okay, so service switch is Seventh in, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay. Oh. Coin counter is, okay, yeah, that's the other thing I want to try, sorry. Let me show you, I'll, I'll show you what I'm looking at. Uh, coin counter for player one, I'm assuming, is this position 11. So right on the bottom when I do coin and then on the top, coin counter, position 11. So that's two over here. Anyone know what that does, coin counter? find out. Okay, so I'm heading over. Uh, there's also the possibility that I'm starving this thing for current, although I, I don't know, I don't think so. It's uh, the five volt line is drawing about two and a half amps, uh, which seems possibly reasonable. Uh, oh, and one other thing I could be uh, I won't do this now, but a thing that I probably should research is the uh, dip switches here. So there are dip switches for probably setting things like um, number of lives you get per coin and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll look into those too. That could also be a, an answer to, to how to make this uh, work. Okay, so we'll try, uh, I'm gonna try coin counter just to see, nothing there. Okay, so let's do coin. Okay, I got a bunch of coins. Now let's see if I do coin counter. No, and that might be an output. I, I actually don't know what that one does. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, just for fun. No, okay, so let's just try service. Uh, where'd we say service was? It is 
One, two, three, four, five. Okay. <laughs> That's a fun one to count right in the middle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's it right there. Anything there? No. And I, and I don't know if you need to hold that while it's uh, starting up or what. One or two players. Yeah. Okay. Let's cut that there. I will do some playing and researching and uh, looking into it. Yeah, Super U, I, I think, I agree. I bet Coin Counter is some kind of an output. Um, although, I don't know, do they have, I don't know what it would, where it would output to. Maybe there were light up uh, coin, coin counts displays. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, that's going to do it for today. Uh, I will remind you, if you want to go get some stuff, you won't get one of these, but if you want to get some of the other associated stuff for this or for other projects and get yourself a nice 10% off in the store, then head on over to adafruit.com and on your way out, type in scramble. Uh, you know now why that's the coupon code. Type in scramble in the uh, coupon field and it will automatically take 10% off any stuff you buy. It won't work on software or subscriptions or gift certificates, but you can get stuff for 10% off and that's good until midnight tonight, East Coast time. And don't forget about daylight savings if you're not observing that. Uh, that's, uh, that's going to get you your 10% off today. So uh, that is going to do it for me. Thanks everyone so much for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out over in our chats over on YouTube and on Discord. I appreciate the uh, the conversation and the, the tips and help and, and uh, suggestions. That's great. Uh, I will be back with more. And if I get this thing uh, doing more, I'll, uh, I'll post it online before then. So thanks everyone for stopping by for Adafruit Industries. I am John Park, and this has been John Park's Workshop. Bye-bye.